amazing site behind us and one we'd rarely see here in Strangford Loch because Seagen, which came here in 2008, has its uh, turbines raised for maintenance. And that lets you see the extraordinary phenomenon that's managing to capture tidal energy here in the Straits. Now, this is also the site of the world's biggest monitoring project, environmental monitoring, to make sure that the turbines have as little impact as possible on the seals, on porpoises, on seabirds, uh, even on the benthic, which is the plant species that grow on the bottom. And it's been a three-year monitoring project. It'll go on for another two years. Part of that has involved an engineer standing on that tower behind me on CGEN and looking on the surface to see if seals are approaching. And if they are, they have to hit a button to stop the turbines. Down below, uh, there's a sonar device which is trying to capture the same seal movements underwater. And there's been a lot of work trying to reconcile the two to find out the question, the big question. Do seals approach the turbines? And if they do, what happens? Common seal numbers are down everywhere. Our boatman, John Murray, has worked on the loch for 30 years. They're nothing like what they used to be years ago. When that virus came a number of years ago, it went, and the population never came back the same as what it was. A thousand common seals here. And what do you reckon it is now? I say it's down to three, four hundred. That was the downside for MCT, the developers of CGEN. But it also gave them an opportunity to prove their technology in one of the most controlled environments with some of the strongest tidal currents about. So they agreed to a testing regime for their massive twin turbine device to collect evidence of how CGEN interacts with seals and other animals. For three years, Daryl Burkett of Queen's University has sat at this observation post opposite CGEN to gather this vital evidence firsthand. We need to know if CGEN is going to cause any changes in the behaviour, the distribution patterns, the feeding patterns of any of the species that call Strangford Loch their home. Um, so in order to tell if there's been a change, we need to tell what was there before. So as soon as marine current turbines had an idea of where in the narrows they wanted to place sea gen, I started collecting the information. I sit for three hours and I scan very, very slowly, panning from the north to the south, from as far as I can see to the north, as far as I can see to the south, and then back again. With these very special binoculars? With these very special binoculars, yes. In here is a magnetic compass and a laser light. And when I press the button on the left-hand side, in the eyepiece comes up the magnetic bearing at which I'm looking. And if I press the button on the right-hand side, um, the distance to whatever I'm pointing at comes up. So what are you actually plotting then when you've got that kind of information? With the ranges and bearings we can calculate the position of every individual sighting and then we can plot distribution maps of, for example, with the black guillemots, where they are flying, where they're sitting out, where they're uh, drifting to and fro on the water, where they're fishing, if we see them fishing. Seals, what have you found about them? They too are mostly travelling up and down through the narrows, out of the main stream of the current, which is of course where sea gen's been put, because that's what sea gen's designed to catch, catch the current. Um, so as far as the seals are concerned, um, there doesn't seem to have been any change at all in their behaviours. I suppose people would say, you can only see the seals that surface. Ah, that's where you need to speak to Andy Murray, who can see the seals underwater because he's in charge of the sonar device. Andy Murray is one of the marine scientists who now works on shore, monitoring CGEN's sonar from a computer screen. But it's not without its challenges. The wake off the pile is quite visible because a lot of a lot of bubbles are brought up during that, and that's one thing that the sonar actually picks quite well up. You know. Yeah. So you would need to be able to distinguish between turbulence 
um, seaweed and a seal pop. How do you do that? Well, it, it's all about experience. Uh, I was out on the, the turbine for a year or so, uh, working with marine mammal observers, and they were ground truthing any sort of data that we got on That's the screen. That's ground truthing? Well, basically, it's if somebody says, okay, I, I've seen uh, a common seal diving at uh, 80 metres, can you see anything? From experience, I can say, well, that was a seal, you know, it looks very like it. I can just lean across and press one button on the turbine uh, panel here, and that will shut the turbine down really? in three seconds. So, it's so you don't even need to get your feet wet? No, no, it's all, all remote, all remote. But the bottom of the loch is not a benign environment. Dr Graham Savage of Queen's University should know he's put monitoring devices into that tidal race with unexpected results. We'd deployed a couple of them on the seabed and unfortunately we lost them. Uh, they were really weighted down on the seabed and we went back. It gives you some idea of what goes on there when the tide is running in the narrows there. There must be cobbles, stones, rocks rolling around the bottom and sediment and you know, it, 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 it must be an incredibly dynamic environment. I caught up with two Davids who know all about the power of Strangford's tides. Dr David Irwin is an environmental scientist and David Ainsworth is CGEN's project manager. David Irwin first. Underneath the water where we are here, it's just 100% covered with soft corals, with sponges. It's absolutely incredible, straight out of barrier reef time. I mean, it's beautiful down there. and and. It, High energy areas will always be like this. But it wouldn't be the case that you'd think a seal trying to catch fish <laughs> in a current like that is a bit like us trying to have a sandwich in a hurricane. Well, they don't do too much when the tide's running very hard. I mean, they, they'll find somewhere quiet when the tide is going flat out. Uh, in fact, we've found that there, there are two peaks in the day of, of when seals are at their, at their most common, is when the tide is slack. Yeah. So when the tide goes down, the seals are active. When the tide's running very strong, well, the seals do, don't appear. And the turbines are slack when the, when the, when the tide is slack. Exactly. exactly. And that's, exactly. One of, that's one of the big questions that we're helping to answer here, is that the correlation between seal activity and the turbine activity is mutually exclusive. And the little noise that's generated by the machine holds them maybe a little bit away from it. So the single installation is not a problem. If they stay away and they're only there at slack water, we don't have a problem. And they're not playful enough to just want to nose well, around it. We're, we're almost slightly worried about the occasional kamikaze seal, but we haven't had one yet. We have spent rather a lot on the environmental monitoring, yes. Mm. It's probably um, unprecedented for any renewable project. So let's just put a figure, is it three million, four million pounds? Um, in that order, yes. Proving turbines don't damage seals has been tough and expensive for MCT. Even if CGEN gets the OK here in Strangford, an array or cluster of devices somewhere else might need new tests. Can the industry afford it? With 61 engineers, scientists, developers and biologists from 11 countries, Equimar is a big EU marine energy research project. Our job is to devise fair, workable standards to help this new industry prosper and expand. Those standards or protocols will cover everything from environmental monitoring to efficiency, and they'll be ready by the end of 2010.